age, at just 11 years old, I signed a five-year album contract with a, with a record company called Decca Records. I also started a te te television commercial at seven years old. At an early age, I was on a fast track to fame and fortune. But God had dramatically different plans for my future. I'm Keith Green, and this is my life story. I was a, sec I was a successful secular singer and songwriter before I came to Christ. I wrote music, sang, and played the piano for many years in, music in popular music clubs in Los Angeles, California. After coming to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I became well known for the Christian music I wrote. I impacted lives through Christ and challenged Christians to live completely and authentically for Christ. I did more than record for music. I was a speaker, Bible teacher, mentor, and ministry leader. I did all these many things in a short amount of time before my death at the early age of 28 years old. I was born on October 21st, 1953, in Sheepside Bay, New York. My parents were Harvey and Char Green. My father was a school teacher, and my mother was a singer in the big band era of the 1940s. But I also had a grandpa who was a songwriter. My family was Jewish, but their religion was Christian Science. Christian Science has the the study of funny fact is Christian Science has the word Christian in it, but it's not Christian at all. Christian Science takes away from biblical truths and teachings. As a baby, my mother said I had perfect pitch as I sang my baby songs. I could hum, hum, rock my baby, flawlessly. I also had one sibling, an older sister. I was almost three when my family moved to San Fernando Valley, California. Music was my main hobby and passion. I played the ukulele, guitar, and piano. At the age of nine and a half, Colonel Tom Parker, the manager of the King of Rock and Roll, Elvis Presley, saw me on a television show. He called to tell how impressed he was and, and offered his help in the music business. And if he wasn't already busy with Elvis, he would have been my manager. He also said I was going to be a big star. This is two years later when I signed my first recording deal with a major record company. I was the youngest member to join ASCAP, which stands for the American Society of, of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. I thought I was surely on my way to becoming a famous celebrity. It was soon after when my plans came crashing down. Another young preteen star, Donny Osmond, has stolen the spotlight and become America's new teen heartthrob. I became, fr I became frustrated with the music business and was starting to question my family's Christian science beliefs. At 16, in my senior year at El Camino Real High School, I ran away from home and spent time in the state of Washington. Like m most young adults, in the 1970s, I was seeking new spiritual truths. And I started to use hallucinogenic drugs like LSD. I soon returned home, but continued on my spiritual truth for faith in God. I'd, I'd, run, away four, I'd run away two more times. In fact, my parents helped teach me a lesson and allowed me to be thrown in jail as a runaway. While I was there, I wrote songs, but not having any paper, I scratched out words on the wall with the heel of my shoe. I, I was 19 when I met a woman who was a fellow musician and seeker of spiritual truths. Her name was Melody. A year later, Melody and I got married on Christmas Day, 1978. We were I don't believe in Christians, but we were still interested and respected him.
Melody and I tried to advance my music career. Appearing so the local Hollywood clubs and did a little song songwriting for CBS Records. Melody and I had been looking more into Jesus and what, and what the Bible said about him. A good friend of ours, a Christian rock artist, Randy Stonehill, had, had kept trying to share with us the meaning of the gospel. We even got into some pretty heated debates over who Jesus really was. When I was 21 years old, Melody and I completely committed our lives to Christ and never looked back. For several months after I became a Christian, I turned down every concert booking. I wanted to study God's word and pray. I didn't just want to use my musical talents to impress others and glorify myself. I wanted to play music to lead my listeners to Christ. We began telling other, everyone we met about Jesus and his love and forgiveness. We would meet complete strangers off the street and invite them into our home to show God's love. Young teen moms or drug users who were trying to clean up their lives. We would invite them into our home and help them with their situation. We did all this to, so that they would come to Jesus as their Savior. The house became known as the Greenhouse a place where people grew. In 1977, we began calling our outreach Last Days Ministries. These are so strongly influenced by the 19th century revival preacher Charles Finney. Repentance and forgiveness of sin were very important to me. I had full personality and sometimes offended people with the truth. I got better with this later in life as I learned about God's grace. many other musicians who were believers. I started working with them and recording on their albums. I was still hoping to complete my dream of getting a secular record deal, but I was continually turned down because God had bigger and better plans for my future. I, get, I began playing at concerts and churches, but had a hard time accepting money for my, for, for my music performances. In 1977, I signed another record deal with Christian record label, Sparrow Records. My first Christian album, For Him Who Has Ears to Hear, was released in the summer of 1977. In 1978, I released my second album, No Compromise. One of my most well-known concerts was in the state of Oregon in the summer of 1978. It was there at the Jesus Northwest Festival in front of 35,000 people that, that I boldly preached that Christians cannot compromise their faith, that they should live a life completely committed to God. Thousands recommitted their hearts to Jesus that night. Another powerful concert series, The Revival, took place in March of 1979 at Oral Roberts University. I warned the 4,500 college students to stop playing deadly games with God and repent of their sins. I preached that the world is tired of praise the Lord. They want to see it. We, we were, Melody and I referred to this time in our ministry lives as the revival time. It, I knew that I knew that it didn't just apply to others, it applied to me as well. It was then that I repented of my own sin and rededicated my life to Christ. In September of 1978, Melody and I had our first child and only son, Josiah David Green. Our ministry had outgrown the rental houses in California, so we packed up and moved to a 140-acre ranch in Lindale, Texas. I felt it was wrong to put a price on the gospel. It made me angry when I saw other Christians trying to make money off of Jesus, but by putting his name across a dove or a fish on ordinary items like 
wallets, clocks, or posters and selling them for twice the price. It made me even more angry when someone told me that they had made over $98,000 by selling Jesus junk at a Christian music festival. I wanted to give my albums to those who could not afford them or charge nothing for a ticket to my concerts if someone did not have enough money to attend. I asked for a deal to be released from my contract with Sparrow Records. Thankfully, they agreed. I privately produced my third album through, my, through our ministry. It was called, So You Want to Go Back to Egypt. The famous secular rock musician and icon Bob Dylan had become a Christian and made a guest appearance on the album. He also played harmonica on the song, I Pledge My Head to Heaven. Soon, our second child, a daughter, Bethany Grace, was born in February of 1980. A year later, our third child and second daughter, Rebecca Joy, was born in July 1981. That same year, my fourth album of Best of Songs was released called The Keith Green Collection. I wanted my fifth album to be a little bit le less intense and more about praise and worship. It was entitled Songs for the Shepherd. I wanted to give, it was trying to take a break. I wanted to give Melody a European vacation. While we were in Europe, we visited several missionary centers that were part of Youth with the Mission. We were amazed and saddened to see how many lost people there were in Europe. Unlike on, in America, where there was a, a church on almost every corner. There was very little Christian influence in the European countries we visited. We got back, when we got back from Europe, I began to plan a fall concert tour to benefit missions and encourage other believers to become missionaries. I started preaching that this generation of Christians is responsible of this generation of people on this earth. Just like in the military, the, the soldiers are supposed to obey the last command they were given. And if, and if we don't uh, obey our commands and people aren't coming to Christ, it's our fault and that we're not doing our job. Well, the last order that we got from our commander, Jesus, was to go into all the world. It was to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Mark 18, Mark 16:15. I was just, I was excited to go, get out on the upcoming fall tour, but it never happened. God had different. Yet again, God had different plans. On the hot day of July 28, 1982. Friends of our family, John and Dee Dee Smalley, and their six children came to visit us on their way to start a new church in Connecticut. While they were there, they wanted to see more of the last day's ministry's property. I asked the pilot of our small, small Cessna 414 to take us up for a flyover. He agreed. Melody was pregnant with our fourth child, Rachel, so she decided not to go along. Little Rebecca also stayed behind. Josiah and Bethany wanted to go too, so they, they came up along with us for the flyover, flight tour. When I said goodbye to Melody, we didn't realize that this would be the last time we would be together as a family on this earth. Shortly after we left, Melody received a phone call from a girl in our office saying that our plane had just gone down and she was going to call an ambulance. But what she and Melody didn't realize was that we were already home with the Lord. Everyone on board, all 12 of us, had passed away in the violent crash. My short 28 years on this earth had come and gone, but my legacy still continues today. John 12, 24 says, Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, 
it produces many seeds. Jesus was speaking about himself in this passage, in his death, resurrection, and the spread of the good news. However, it can apply to people who have died living a life for the Lord. I tried to live a completely committed life to Christ. And as a result, many lives have been impacted and changed for God. During my lifetime and after my death, people have been encouraged and changed in their faith through my music and ministry. Many have even become missionaries and or have begun their own or have begun their own ministries. Some people are saying a Christian life was like a shooting star. It burned hot and fast for a short amount of time and was as quickly was extinguished in a dramatic form. In 2001, I was inducted into the Gospel Music Hall of Fame along with the Christian rock music pioneer Larry Norman and rock and roll icon Elvis Presley. As you may know about me by now, this was a nice honor, but I found my true purpose in glory by taking the spotlight off of myself and putting it on Jesus alone. In closing, I would like to leave you with part of my lyrics to one of my songs. It was a prayer of my life, and I hope it be will become my prayer as your prayer as well. Make my life a prayer to you. I want to do what you want me to. No empty words, no white lies, no token prayers, no compromise. I'm Keith Green, and this is my life story. So now I'd like to show you a video of one of my live concerts, and it will be uh, it will be uh, of two songs of my songs that I have done. I think we'll get to watch um, just a couple minutes of it, Mr. Green. <laughs> and then I'll pull this, if you want to pull down some Kyle, I'll get it. 